Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Josh Bear. I publish The Bear Facts. I'm an art advisor. Our esteemed guest will give a short interview, not interview us, intro for who they are and why they're here. The, the one comment that I'd like to make, and I think we all share, is that whatever the effects of the election on the art market, it pales insignificant to the effects of the election on the entire world. So that's the context, the bigger picture that all of us, and I'm sure everybody here feels, and then we're gonna narrow down in a much more specific way, I hope. So this would be Dan. I'm uh, Dan Salek, and I am the, uh, one of the founding partners of a company in Washington called Subject Matter, and we do uh, advertising, communications, and government relations, and then I also have the uh, honor of serving now as the chair of the board of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington as well. And you spent a number of years working in Congress. Yeah, and I, I spent about uh, 12 years working both in the, the House of Representatives for uh, Richard Gephardt, who was the majority and minority leader at the time, and also working on congressional campaigns as well. Hi, I'm Heather Podesta. I have a government relations firm in Washington, D.C., which means I'm a lobbyist. And um, I have been a longtime collector and am on the board of MOCA in Los Angeles. So with the museum part in mind, we're going to try to, I mean, we all have emotional reactions to what happened earlier this month, but we're going to try to, to do a little bit more policy walk kind of thing. So as you're both museum trustees and you've both been around tax law, what is the likely events of uh, what may be coming in terms of for museums and charitable deductions and the future there? Let's start at that point. So Heather, you want to give it a roll? So the, the headline is collectors may have more money, but they may be less inclined to spend it. So when Trump won, there was sort of great euphoria that there would be tax reform and that um, it would help those most in need, his blue collar billionaire buddies. And um, now that we've started to see the details of what tax reform looks like, it, it poses some really interesting challenges for the world of art. Um, first off, there's been a lot of attention paid to the estate tax. This is an issue that affects very few Americans, but a majority of Americans feel that it's wrong. Now, with having Republican control of the House, the Senate, and now the White House, there's a good chance, better than 50-50 chance, that the, the limits will go up significantly or that it will be repealed. So that's a possibility. Another possibility is that charitable deductions are either done away with or significantly limited. Um, as part of tax reform. In order to bring the corporate rate down to 15%, you gotta figure out where else you're gonna get that money. And charitable donations is always an area that's discussed. So if we're looking at an environment where there is no estate tax and there aren't benefits for charitable giving, what does that mean in terms of collectors and the way that they're treating their collection? Will, are Americans as generous as we think we are when the tax code doesn't support that generosity? We'll see. And, and I guess what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to broaden out the discussion, I think, a little bit beyond just the, you know, collector museum piece of this. And I think whether you are for Hillary Clinton or for Donald Trump, I think if you're in the art world and in the art community, there is a whole separate set of issues about what we need to do to make sure that this administration, this Congress, protect arts education, protect other parts of the, of the tax law that actually help artists and help uh, on, the, on the education front. And I think if we don't do that and we forget about that piece, the museums will be weakened, the art schools will be weakened, 
public education is going to be weakened. So I think it's a bigger issue than just the just tax reform alone. I think when you start to look at the broad spectrum, it's it's not just about they are going to cut everything or destroy everything. I think a lot of it's our responsibility to make sure that as advocates for the arts, not just collectors, that we actually get engaged and make sure that the Treasury Secretary and other key officials sort of understand what, what's at stake. So are there more specifics to say about charitable deductions? Certainly the Hirshhorn has an additional issue in that its major funder is the United States government. And it's basically owned to some degree by the U.S. government and its largest support. Do you as chairman of that, are you uh, convening special meetings to see what's going to happen? Well, I, think, I think historically the Smithsonian budget has been pretty protected. I think it's seen by both parties as a kind of a crown jewel of, of the government uh, and, a, and a huge service to the public. But by the same token, the Hirshhorn and all the other Smithsonian institutions every year are raising more and more private money to keep going with the programming that they have. Uh, and I think the pressure is going to continue on, uh, on the federal side of the equation of that. But I, I think the big issue that Heather was talking about is I, I think when you start talking about things like the estate tax, how many collectors do we know who spend significant amounts of time working with museums or setting up private foundations and thinking about how to move their artwork from their private to public or semi-public uh, well, let's and focus on the estate tax and what it means. So if you die with $200 million worth of assets and $100 million of that is art, are you more or less likely to sell that art, keep that art, or give that art in, in this environment if estate taxes are repealed? One would hope that one would keep to their original estate plan and the commitments that they have made to individuals and to museums, but I think the incentives change and the environment changes. In addition, I think there will be a real um, attack on personal foundations. And this is an issue that Chuck Grassley has spent a lot of time and attention on in terms of people setting up foundations. And, you know, the voters made it very clear that they're tired of the protected class making rules for themselves and for their own benefit. So Trump and... Republican leadership is going to need to come up with some examples of the greatest abuse, abuses of how the wealthy stay wealthy. And I think we're a little vulnerable. So we're repealing the estate tax, that's a good way. <laughs> so let them, you know, let's get rid of all those abuses of the rich people by letting them keep all their money forever. Yeah, but there's, but there's so many contradictions like that that have surfaced in the last year. And I think there's going to be a a reconciliation, but I think there's seems to be a, a growing consensus that there will be tax reform. A growing consensus that there'll be a simplification of the of the tax code. And look, tax policy affects behavior, and I think you have to look at it as, for a long time, things like the charitable deduction have aided people's mindset about being more philanthropic. And now we'll see. I mean, I think it's a big question because you've got children, you've got Children uh, sell their parents' art to pay their estate taxes because they're mad at their parents for collecting the art in the first place because they weren't paying attention to them. So the, the, the most significant thing they could do to honor their memory is to sell all that art. So the supply of art coming to the market is going to be diminished because there's, if you don't have to sell it to pay tax, you're more likely to keep it. Do we agree or disagree there? Well, I, I mean, my sense is that people, uh, when you're talking about generational, if, if people have the opportunity to easily keep uh, artwork in the hands of their family and then let them decide later, I think they'll probably be inclined to, to want to do that or give less. And I think it's the giving less to public institutions that's a big risk. But if they're able both, to both keep the dollars, it... It's not just art, it's dollars as well. I think the dollars some ways are even more important. But they seem to be implying charitable deductions will stand. They seem to be leaning that way. So if you don't have to sell it to pay taxes, 
and you get it and you give it away, then maybe that may be good news for the museums that they might get more material. I, I I don't see it playing out that way. And I think with charitable donations, they they will be cut back. I wouldn't be surprised if they're capped at an annual limit of a hundred thousand dollars. And you know, when you look at the bulk of the charitable giving, it's in sums above two dollars. I mean, it's it's sums of a hundred thousand clips of two hundred thousand, and so. Um, it is definitely targeting a certain activity among the 1% of the 1%. But I guess my question to you, Josh, is sort of a, not to take over your interviewing, but as, as an art world leader is, you know, put the shoe on the other foot. There are obviously these big tax policy issues. There are a lot of other issues. How does the art community in a much more serious way, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, bind together to actually support the arts in a serious way. I feel like right now it's a little bit, uh, it, it's serious in some places, but it's very casual and, and unstructured in others. It's can the art world and art community actually have an agenda that they're pushing in Washington that's, uh, that's serious and powerful? Well, I think we're, we would all like to believe that the art world will do something. I think the art world is sort of bifurcated between the people on the left who work at the galleries, the museums, the auction houses, and their clients who are maybe more on the right. So there's already kind of an inherent split there. But I think people in America who want to do good will continue to do good. And um, that I'm optimistic there. But I think Dan's point that we'll have to be more vigilant to protect infrastructure things like arts education if the schools, you know, if we have no Department of Education, will Mississippi be able to say more easily, no art in the schools? And does the United States push for an art agenda through the Department of Education? I don't know, do we? Uh, not forcefully enough. Um, you know, and, and it's not a big, you know, it's, it's no one's priority, and I think that's a, it's a huge, uh, you know, gap that needs to be filled. And, and we also have a situation where there isn't exactly an, in, an embrace of First Amendment rights. Second Amendment rights, absolutely. First Amendment, maybe not so much. And so I think um, we will see, and we've seen sort of the chilling of First Amendment. And I think that is a call to the art community to speak and to create and to educate and communicate. And um, I think museums play a vital role. Hirshhorn is in a very difficult position um, because there is that threat of somebody pulling the, the funding. But, you know, museums, I'm on the board of MOCA, and, you know, we convened folks around Black Lives Matter and had a really important discussion. And museums should be forums at this point, and artists' voices need to be heard. And, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that actually what we're going to see is great artwork. Like, this is my silver lining, is that out of this confusing time period that artists dig very deep and create something incredible. That's not the art market, but it's more important than the art market. It's, it's actually <laughs> the art, you yeah. know, because the rest of the discussion, the way it's framed a little bit, is about the 1%. And most people actually believe that while you may hate what happened like we do, that for the art business, this is going to be good. I mean, the perception is rich people are going to have more money and they're going to buy more art. So that's meant to be the silver lining, right? But, but what, is, that, but, is that a basic but, but I'm not sure, premise? I'm not so sure. I think there's another argument to be made that, um, you know, art has been a great investment for a lot of people for the last 10 years much better than probably some other asset classes. And I think we are about to see major tax reform. You're about to see a rollback of regulations in a whole bunch of industries, including financial industry, that are going to create a lot of growth opportunities for those companies. You can decide whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing. 
Uh, and uh, I think you're going to start to see a lot of other activity in the financial markets where people say... So if interest rates go up to 10%, the art market's going to dry up from easy money, well, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I would say I think, I think the real question is, and, and I think we see this a lot, how many people are collectors or donors to museums under any circumstance who are just, they have to collect because they love art, they have to give because they want to give and see museums thrive, and how many people are have been strategic. And there are a lot of people who are involved in the art world that are just either strategically involved because they think there are good investments to be had. It's not like they don't like art, but they're not, uh, they don't live and die for it. And I think if you can make more money in energy are stocks, people do you gonna move make money more money? Stocks? Or is the reality they're gonna make less money with what's going on? Well, I think we're in a time of great uncertainty. And so I think, what you'll see in the short term is not a lot of great artwork coming to market. Um, you know, people who have blue chip pieces of art are not going to sell it, in part because, all right, you sell it, you've got the money. Where are you going to stick the money? Whereas you can actually live with something beautiful that you love and, and continue to treasure it and know that its value is is solid. And so I think it's really too early to tell. In some ways, Trump campaigned in a way that wasn't dissimilar to Obama. Obama came into office with hope and change and not a lot of detail. But, but everybody heard and knew in their heart that what he was talking about was true to them, and they had their own impression of what he was going to do as a president. In some ways, Trump has done that with the other half of the country to sort of say, hey, I'm going to make America great again. You know, follow me. You have nothing to lose. There's been a Bush or a Clinton um, in, on the uh, ballot six out of the eight last elections. You know, this isn't working for you. Give me a shot. All right, well, what is your policy? Nobody knows. And so at this point, it, it's really unclear what, what Congress will produce and he will sign at the end of this year, at the end of the, the next two years. And so, um, you know, for, for my clients, you know, chaos is opportunity, but chaos is chaos, and they want certainty. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think the other thing we haven't talked about in terms of policy is that the art world has been a, an incredibly dynamic global market for the last eight years. And I think we've had a president who embraced globalism. And I, I wonder, uh, you know, based on what happens from a policy perspective in terms of our relationships with other governments, in terms of trade policy, do we start to break off and become much more regionalized again? And, you know, we'll, who knows if that has any impact on the art market, but certainly from a philosophical standpoint, the last eight years have been about uh, people from different cultures collecting art from uh, other cultures, and I think that, you know, it's unclear whether that spirit stays the same. And, and one of the major cornerstones of the tax reform proposal that's being considered in the House is a border adjustability tax. It's not a VAT, but it acts a lot like a VAT. And so we, we may find ourselves in a position where buying work from American artists, from American galleries, is less expensive than buying art um, from foreign-based artists or foreign galleries. So we could have tariffs going on. Yeah. I mean, for Brazilians, there used to be a, I don't know, 50% import duty on art. Right. Or it might have been 100%. And imagine a trade war with China where they fight back and say, okay, we're going to put 100% tariff on, a, on Western art. That's, I'm afraid that the art world is such an easy target to make an example that we don't really want to fight about cars, right. or big, but if we put up a false front about, well, we're going to tax art, mm -hmm. 
and it's only affecting the rich people anyway, it's good policy, that that could be a, uh, that we're an easy. Well, it's, uh, well, it's, it's a tweetable yeah. uh, action. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, I, but I think what's interesting to me, you know, we, we both work for a lot of large industries, and I think what's interesting about the art world is in a very short period of time, it's gone from being a small, discrete industry to being a very large, multi-billion dollar global industry, but I don't think they've ever really had to grapple with uh, policy issues the way that they may have to. And, and, and I think, to me, it's not just about the tax issues, it's actually, I think there's much more connectivity than people think between the tax issues, between, uh, you know, things like arts education between how museums are treated and supported. I think there's, there's almost a need for a, a look at an agenda that actually looks holistically at what's going to make the art market and the art world and the more philanthropic part of the art world sort of thrive together when, you know, look, I, I think there is going to be an assault from a policy perspective on, you know, a lot of the uh, parts of the art world that we treasure, which are, you know, things like museums, education, how artists can get access to affordable housing. You know, a lot of the things that I think we don't really think about when we're walking around art fairs asking about prices. Well, it, it seems to me there's an opportunity for, say, the Art Dealers Association of America to say, wait a second, this is our industry. Maybe we need to hire Dan and Heather to articulate what's good for our business to Congress, but at the same time to keep in mind there's something bigger yeah. than how many sales Gagosian Gallery makes or not, because Gagosian Gallery is going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Whether it's up or down, the people who are going to be fine in this fair will be fine. But there would be something to argue to come together and to really have a place at the table. And I'm serious between with people like you working for them if you're also forcing them to keep art and the greater... Well, and the, and the big danger to me is is the are the public institutions. I think that's that's what that's what's mostly at risk. And I think that if we keep the focus on less about you know people who are incredibly wealthy are going to find a way. They always find a way to beat the the system and get the most out of the tax code. And they've got plenty of people who can help them do that. I think it's the public art institutions that suffer. And it's not going to be MoMA, I guarantee you, they're going to be fine. It's the smaller museums, it's uh, smaller arts institutions and, and uh, places where, you know, people are really getting a lot of meaning out of that, but they don't get a lot of recognition, where they struggle year over year to raise money. If it gets harder all of a sudden, even at that level, they're not getting So Heather, support. can you see MOCA, the board saying, well, we'll be okay, but what about all these small arts institutions around LA that don't have the reach that we have, maybe we have to sort of do some leadership to, to help our county, community, state, maybe once we know a little bit more of the details of what's going to happen. And, and those efforts are already underway, but it becomes a lot more important. And I think, you know, for those of us who live in the, the coasts and in cities that voted a certain way, actually voted with the majority of the people of the United States, um, it is incumbent on us to not just live in that bubble. And so it would be great to see not only sort of the, the smaller community um, efforts, but to, to have, um, you know, MOCA pair up with a, a museum in Iowa and bring the resources and the ideas and sort of adopt a district. I mean, if every super blue district sort of adopted a red one and helped send in people, helped send in money and, and created more of a conversation, um, you know, that's how you begin to turn areas purple. You can tell my bias is in turning things purple and then very deep blue. Um, <laughs> But I do think, um, you know, the natural inclination after an election like this is to really um, turn inward and to surround yourself with people who think like yourself. And I think that's why the Democrats actually 
uh, one of the reasons why they, they lost this election. And so it's incumbent on all of us to sort of create a, a plus one, like, all right, I'm going to find one person in a different part of the world that I'm going to connect with. And there is no better thing than the arts to connect because it, it's, it's visual, it's emotional, um, and it, it can be political, it can be non-political, but it's, it is communication. And we just, um, you know, I, my challenge for myself and everyone in this room is, you know, what are you doing to bring art, art education, you know, First Amendment values to other parts in the, of the country who, who rejected the last eight years. Yeah, and, what, and what's interesting, though, too, is that when you think about the arts and the art world, I find it fascinating that you have, uh, it's a truly bipartisan world. You've got staunch Republicans who are buying cutting edge contemporary art. And I think somehow, if you can figure out a way to focus not just on the collecting or not just on the, let's call it the big league philanthropy of giving to MoMA and giving to the major institutions and start talking to people on both sides of the aisle who support politicians. You know, there, there are plenty of Democrats and Republicans in the art world who are giving millions of dollars to uh, elected officials. And I think somehow channeling that to get them to support the arts in a bipartisan way, I think is an interesting opportunity that a lot of other uh, industries and, and uh, issues don't have. They don't have that kind of broad and passionate bipartisan support. So I'm gonna ask you each the same question next and then we'll go to que questions from the audience. So when this panel was planned months ago, I know that Heather and I don't do much, like we started thinking about what to talk about probably yesterday, but Dan, so Heather, you can go second, but Dan is more of a planner. So you were probably thinking months ago what you were going to say about the effect of the election on the art market, and what did you expect to be saying? I, I was struggling to think about what it would be. I, I, my sense is it would be more of the same if uh, Hillary Clinton had been elected president in terms of uh, a continuation of the way things are. I, I would probably still be saying that even under Obama, there's been a lot of nice discussion about bigger support for the arts, but it's not a big priority. And I think, you know, to me, when, it, when I think about the policy agenda, I feel like it's really arts education and getting money to public and underfunded schools and communities is the, the piece that's missing, because I think that creative piece is actually gonna be what helps people thrive when they're trying to get a job in, in the 21st century now. And, uh, you know, I just think that part's completely missing from both political parties, to be honest with you. Heather, what did you expect to be saying this afternoon that you're not? Like Dan, in terms of the art market and where we sit here today, um, that things would largely be the same. But, I mean, what we saw through the primaries, Democrat and Republican, is there is huge economic dislocation and pain out in the country, which is, is gonna define you know, the next four, eight years. And in spite of really you know, the, the unemployment rate today, it was announced it's 4.6%. And, um, but people feel really disconnected from institutions, they feel free, to attack institutions. And so I think what my message would have been is, you know, 1% is still fine. Maybe they'll have to pay more. Um, now, you know, maybe they'll have a little more money in their pocket. But I think um, museums, um, education organizations need to be doing more to connect to people. Can you raise your hand if you have a question and we'll get a microphone to you? And please say if you're an artist or a collector or a journalist so we have some context a little bit of where you're coming from. 
Hi, I'm from Washington, D.C., and I like to follow the arts uh, now that I'm retired. But I, I'm interested in knowing what the Hirshon is doing for local artists and embracing them and giving them a venue and an opportunity. And um, uh, the aspect of how many, um, you know, I think collectors, it's wonderful if you can be a, a, a sublime co collector who can amass a, a you know wonderful collection but the reality is is it's the investment for for their um, for to get the big tax benefit when in fact they donate to a big museum which makes the museum viable I suppose but it's and how do we how do we embrace the preponderance of artists who really want to have a chance and how do you yourself if you want us education how does the museum itself right. give that education venue perhaps opportunities All right so it's so the Hirshhorn and I and I'm I'm knowledgeable but not the expert the, one of the big focuses at the Hirshhorn is a, a program called art lab for teens and it's really a drop-in program that's mostly for the underserved community but not exclusively because I think there's a, a desire to have just teens taking advantage of this. And we've, we're spending a lot of time really looking at how to make that program a true national model. Uh, and in terms of local artists, I, I think the Hirshhorn tries to uh, engage with the local arts community where you know, we just had a fantastic installation by a DC artist named Lynn Myers who uh, did a wall installation around the entire interior uh, ring of the building, which was spectacular. So I, I think, to me, I think working with local artists can take a, a bunch of different forms, including being supportive of their careers. But I think the arts education program that we're working on with Art Lab and trying to scale that up and create partnerships with places like Howard University and, and others is a way to, to get deeper into the community. But look, it's, it's hard too, because that, all that requires money. And there's a constant tension that money is not coming from the federal government with the Hirshhorn anymore. That's all private money. And it's, it's about trying to be really strategic and get the funds to be able to expand those programs and put on great shows. Next, can, next question, please. Can I just jump oh. in on yes. the sort of possibility of democratization of artwork, which is Donald Trump showed us that you can take out the middleman. I mean, he totally disrupted the news media, and he went directly to people. And I think we will see something similar happen in the art world. And I think, um, you know, it, it has moved much more slowly in this world, but the very real world of being able to buy and sell meaningful artwork on eBay is tremendous. Well, I would say the platform for social media for artists to skip the middleman to get to their audience certainly is going to happen during, I'm old, but my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it'll look like, but I, it's going to happen. Do we have another question over here? Uh, hi, I'm with a local arts agency here in Florida. We have an arts education program. We give out um, $5 million worth of grants to artists. We have housing for artists in Broward County. And we have a very ro robust public art program where we've got $7 million worth of active projects. Um, Americans for the Arts is our umbrella agency. What should I be going to them and saying if I'm thinking about uh, the statement made where we need to bring the art market together, the, the private sector and the public sector? I, I think I would say, and, and, and I think Heather's probably more of a, of a policy expert than I am, I think it's about being really clear about what the agenda is with this new president and new Congress because, look, this was a watershed election. I think, make no mistake about it, this was a complete turn of events. So I think a lot of, I would say a lot of philanthropic organizations have had a really welcome ear in the Obama administration and even, even in the Bush administration before that on, on certain issues. And I think it's, it's about being really clear about a handful of key things on the tax policy agenda that, that you think or they think, and they're a phenomenal organization, by the way, are really going to uh, either make a big difference or prevent harm 
And then I think it's about being very proactive about talking about what the risks are to uh, things like block grants and, and cutbacks in places like the Department of Education. But, you know, but Bob Lynch at Americans for the Arts is in, and Nora Halpern are incredible advocates. But I think what they've lacked in a way is the full support of the, uh, the amount of wealth and power in the art world. They get some of it. But when you think about the, the amount of power uh, and influence that people who collect intensively have, if that were channeled more into a place like Americans for the Arts, it would be just that much more powerful. But, but you can also bring something of value to them, which is you should know your member of Congress. You should know both of your senators. You, you probably have board members that have that relationship you need to grow and own that relationship and bring that relationship to Washington, that everyone here should be engaged locally. You know, if you have an arts project, please invite your member of Congress to come see it or figure out through degrees of sec separation how to get them engaged. Get your artists in front of them. If you're not able to talk to them in the district, which is the best, um, because you have their attention and you are a voter, um, you know, go to Washington. We all have the right to petition our government, and Congress works for you. And so make sure that your member of Congress, your two senators, know your views and are pushing them forward. Another question? Do you have a question for Heather? And Heather, do you have a question for Dan? <laughs> I'm just going to follow Heather around and see what she's looking at. Uh, yeah, they want to know what you're, the, each other is buying, right? Hi. I'm a collector. I, so, Heather, you mentioned um, wanting to connect with local communities more. Um, how would you see that happening? Would you see that changing the kind of work that gets made? Um, medium or otherwise or I, I couldn't hear the we, oh. we couldn't hear or understand sorry. the question sorry so uh, you mentioned uh, trying to connect more with local communities do you think that that will change the kind of work that gets made the kind of work that gets supported the way that uh, local institutions support work or anything like that I, I think political change changes not only the institutions um, the public, the collectors, but also the artists and the way that artists communicate. I mean, one of the interesting things about uh, the Hillary campaign was there, were, there was no shortage of celebrities who went and did concerts and um, the power of celebrity didn't sway folks. And part of it was, you know, those techniques worked four years ago. They worked eight years ago. Um, but they weren't talking to people where they live. And so, you know, what, what artists and, you know, I think people don't want to hear from a Kardashian when, when they themselves are, are in pain. And so how do you um, communicate and what type of artwork is created to engage in which artists, you know. Um, I think everybody the, is hearing us talking as if the art making is going to move so far to the left and be social atroprop. And what I'm observing in the last month and in this building mm -hmm. is people go, wow, I haven't turned on the news in a month. I don't read the paper anymore. I'm going to come out and buy some art because I want to feel good and I want beauty and I don't want to think about what's going on there. So there's a countervailing thing going on that's quite strong. Some people bought a sweater the weekend after the election. Some people bought a painting. And as much as people are going to move there to be more socially conscious, it's going to be equal number of people who are going to say, but, but I, would say four, I don't want to look. Four years is a very long time to maintain that posture. I think it's impossible. And eventually people are going to have to engage with the world. Uh, artists are, I think, have already been and probably will continue to engage. And 
and maybe a lot of artists who are thinking about the, the global condition may start thinking more about the American condition. Um, but I think it's, you know, there's only so long you cannot watch the news and stay engaged, and I think... And I'm a big fan of emotional buying or eating. Uh, I, I totally respect that as a, a healthy way to deal with some of these things, but we all know the bills come in January. Um, and then you, you sort of move on. I think um, the, the thing that folks need to do is come to terms with um, Donald Trump is our next president. What are we all going to do to help him be successful? Because we all need for him to be a successful president. And, um, you know, it is important that he surround himself with smart people, but it's also, you know, incumbent upon all of us to be engaged. One more question, we have a question here. Yes, hello, my name is Vanessa Sky, and I, ha I own an art gallery, and uh, my question is, what do you suggest as a middle person, um, how can we help that collector and the artist during this political transition? Well, I didn't get the last part. So how, do, how do you as a gallerist help the artist and the collector with what? You mentioned um, that we all have to do something, you know, to help this transition. I mean, we, you mentioned about, um, I mean, think, collectors. Think, think global, act local, I guess. Uh, would yeah, be. I, I think that's right. I think it's, a lot of it to me is about how do you inspire people to get involved in local arts organizations. You know, tax, if tax policy changes and some of the tax incentives are out, it's, the job gets harder. But I think it's some, in some case, it means that the storytelling has to get better and you've got to make the case more forcefully to private philanthropists, local arts uh, funders, uh, because you know it's it's going to be. I, I think once the incentives start to erode, I think it's going to be harder to to convince people to give money. And I think you're just have to be telling your story more forcefully to be able to make that happen. You also have the ability to convene interesting people. You can invite politicians, you can invite your collectors, you can invite your artists to a reception to talk about the importance of arts and education and create your own dialogue and awareness. So on that, I think, thank you, Heather. Thank you, Dan, for uh, making us maybe feel a little better <laughs> after the last few weeks. Thank you, everybody.